Thank you, uh, Ewan, for I think a, a really comprehensive uh, analysis and um, so, some nice differentiation, I think, of what to each key Southeast Asian player has to offer and its, its limitations as well, uh, including as a partner. I like that there was a bit of policy advice uh, for the Australian government in there, given that uh, the Australian taxpayer has been involved uh, very much with, with this event. Um, I hope uh, folks were, were, were listening to that, uh, that interesting advice. We've got some time now for some questions from you and I um, look forward to some of your questions. Uh, there's a few other thoughts I'll try to inject if I get a chance, but um, I think there's a lot, uh, a lot of expertise gathered in this room. So please raise your hand if you have a question and I'll try to see you in the gloom. Um, I think you've got one over there, that's great. We'll start uh, in the middle of the room, thank you. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, Lee Cordner from the University of Adelaide. Um, enjoyed both presentations very much, thank you. Very thought provoking. And it raised a whole lot of questions in my mind. I'm not gonna try and ask all of them, but I'll cover, uh, 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 touch on a couple of them. Um, Raja Mohan, you talked about the new maritime imperative uh, for India, um, and I, I've also read your book, Samutra Mantan, where you expand on that uh, concept, but I wonder how well that is understood in India, whether there is a coherent strategy um, coming from India um, towards maritime or anything else for that matter, and it also begs questions about, uh, more broadly than India, uh, China and, and Yuan in Southeast Asia as well about transparency, um, trust and uh, cooperation between the various uh, regional states and non-regional states and literal players um, and, and where you see that heading in this framework of regional engagement and power projection. I mean, for example, you talked, uh, Raja Mohan, about India developing power projection capabilities but um, Rory, in his opening remarks, suggested that there was some conflict between regional engagement and power protection, or potentially, and you and you, you also mentioned that you didn't think there was a contradiction. So I think within that whole milieu, there are a range of issues that perhaps you could each expand upon in that context of, of you know, of coherency, transparency, uh, trust and cooperation. Thank you. Thanks, Lee, you want to take that? Thank you, I think, uh, good, good questions. A coherent strategy, as I said, this is work in progress. I mean, those of us who think, you know, India should become more navalist, uh, it's a constant struggle because uh, uh, that India has two very long borders. Uh, both those borders are, are tense right now. And therefore, the, the logic of the territorial defense, the traditional argument, uh, continues to uh, be uh, relevant. Uh, but at the same time, that if you look at the long-term structural change of, uh, of India's interests, uh, then uh, you're going to look at uh, the maritime thing is going to get uh, more and more uh, important uh, for India. Uh, but this does not mean, I mean, I think India doesn't have to uh, choose between being a continental power or maritime power, because uh, much like China, I mean, I think a large Indian economy which spends only 2% on its of GDP on defense, out of which 20% goes to the Navy, uh, that if India continues to grow, it will have the resources to build a significant Navy. Uh, so, so, but, the, but the, in, the, in the short term, of course, there are going to be a lot of ups and downs, but I think the direction as, as the Indian interest, India tries to secure its dispersed interests, as I said, 40% of its GDP is linked to the uh, rest of the world, major importer of natural resources, uh, search for major markets. So I think the long-term drive would be, I think, a greater emphasis. I, I would want to sum up what should be uh, India's coherent strategy. I would say uh, hold the north, consolidate the south in the maritime domain, and look east, I, I would say, and the last two components are uh, essentially naval. Uh, the, the second part, I think, on transparency, I think we've come a long way. I mean, I think there was a time when our friends in Southeast Asia, when our friends in Australia was very worried about India's relationship with the Soviet Union. Everybody thought the Soviet Navy was all over the uh, Indian ports. Uh, but I think since then, I, in fact, one of the first naval diplomatic acts that India did was to actually call the Southeast Asian countries uh, for the joint uh, exercises around the Andaman Islands. That's way back in 92, 93. Uh, since then, I think there has been uh, expansive engagement, not only bilaterally, trilaterally, 
for example, in the Malacca Straits, and multilaterally, that India is today far more engaged uh, in multilateral diplomacy or uh, naval diplomacy, whether it is the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium, the Indian Ocean Regional, uh, Indian Ocean Rim Association for Regional Cooperation, uh, or the range of exercises it does through Milan. Uh, there is a, a significant expansion, uh, and I think there is much greater trust. Our problem today is India is not able to meet the demand. Uh, that there is so much demand for uh, Indian cooperation uh, that India's this, the, the challenge is how do you uh, meet those demands, uh, whether it is, as I said, from Mauritius, Seychelles on one side uh, to uh, South China Sea. I mean, the, the demands are large, and how does India manage that? I mean, that is the so creating more domestic capacities uh, is the real issue. In terms of engagement and power projection, look, I, I think there is a difference clearly. I mean, I think one is you engage everyone, but uh, people also would want India to shape the balance of power. As some of our friends in you know, Southeast Asia want India to do more. Probably you know, sell arms, do more, make yourself present in a more sustained basis. Uh, that India has, I think India right now is quite prudent. I mean, it's not trying to inject itself into power politics or change it in any direction. But be a benign player at this point, doing enough to support others and to create options for our friends in Southeast Asia and other places so that, that the strong Indian Navy uh, could eventually uh, contribute to a more stable order uh, in, in Asia. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, please, please go on. Uh, nice to see you, Lee. Um, just brief comments. One, a kind of general point. Actually, first of all, you asked me about uh, the contradiction, whether there is a contradiction between uh, power projection and engagement. I mean, what I meant to describe is that in the sort of simple Venn diagram, there is a shading overlap area between the two, but I think we both, it's in the eye of the beholder, and since the subject was perceptions, I just flagged that there, there is that gray area in which you, I think uh, uh, the ambiguity and the, and the mischief actually lies. Um, on transparency, I think generally we've tended to have over high expectations of transparency. Certainly in the relationship with China, I think by putting transparency as a sort of shibboleth that it would automatically deliver confidence and, and trust, I think was misplaced. And the, the obvious way to, to uh, turn that around is the um, United States is the most openly, almost embarrassingly transparent uh, military system in the world, but it doesn't prevent um, power motivations from being read from from China and, and others. So I think we, that there are limits to it. It delivers uh, uh, positives, but that really gets to the, the other point, the missing ingredient of trust, and trust is the, the real chicken and egg problem. Certainly if you're coming to confidence building measures or, tri or crisis management measures, such as INCSEs or, or, uh, or direct crisis communication hotlines, uh, when one side insists on trust as a, as a prerequisite in order to, uh, to put the arrangements in place, which is a sort of against the, the, the Western dominant mode of thought. Um, but from the other side, the, the, the suspicion often is that that dialogue will actually then be used to you know, leg legitimate naval activities, which are actually the main source of tension in any case. Um, so no, no easy to answer to those both, but I think transparency for me is probably on a lower ranking of, of priorities. We'll um, take a few more questions that, uh, just on your point there, Lee, about uh, the, the tension or the contradiction, I guess I was thinking that um, the platforms you need for uh, power projection are sometimes the, uh, the very platforms that uh, make uh, the need for engagement all the, more, all the greater. There's a, so maybe it's a paradox rather than a contradiction, but uh, just trying to be slightly provocative. Thank you for picking up on that. We've got two, I think, uh, members of the audience just here over, over on my, um, my right. Um, good afternoon, David Palmer. Um, Dr. Moha, am I correct in saying India is about to acquire nuclear submarines? Yes. <laughs> then I ask you, sir, what do you see, or what does India uh, see a nuclear submarine achieving that a conventional boat cannot, and are you running the risk of opening the gates of um, Southeast Asian arms race? Thank you. I don't think India needs to open up an arms race. I, mean, I think an arms race is already on. Uh, that uh, with the fundamental shift uh, in the US-China uh, maritime balance, the expansion of the Chinese military power, uh, everyone is buying submarines. That is uh, the current 
uh, trend. So, so I don't think uh, it is anything rooted with India because uh, those in, in South China Sea today, with Vietnam has bought six kilo class. Uh, Indonesians, I believe, are looking for some. Uh, Singapore has a pretty good uh, submarine capability. So I think that exists. So this idea that there is an arms race I mean, as a fundamentally uh, a negative thing, the question is uh, how, if Asian waters are becoming more important, if the smaller states, the, the middle powers, want to protect their positions, I think submarines are one good way of going about it, and I think that's, that's what most people are doing. As far as Indian nuclear submarine is concerned, I mean, I think uh, uh, India is building conventional submarines as well. I mean, I think the nuclear submarine is essentially uh, two parts to it. I mean, one is as part of building a nuclear triad, uh, because what we are, uh, the indigenous submarine that India is building uh, the Arihant uh, is is a is a SSBN, uh, and India is also way back in the 1980s we got a, a, a nuclear powered submarine from the from the Russians. Now we're getting another one. So what we have is uh, developing the operational experience of operating uh, the the nuclear submarines. Eventually uh, have uh, some number of SSNs uh, which would give India significant reach and the capacity to uh, prevent uh, any kind of a hostile activity in the Indian Ocean. Thanks. I think we've got another question over here on the right. I promise I won't prejudice against the, the left if I see hands raised there, please. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. It's uh, Daniel Lord here from uh, I'm the Staff Officer of Information Warfare at the Australian Maritime Warfare Centre. I've got a question more for you and uh, based on your experience within Singapore where you're operating from at the moment and it's to do with the strength and importance of the five power defence arrangement. Uh, based on the history of uh, the FPDA, it was formed primarily with uh, withdrawal of uh, the United Kingdom obviously from Singapore for the afford affording of protection to both Singapore and Malaysia should uh, any event happen in that region with the formation of an operational headquarters uh, based out of uh, primarily for the HQIAD's perspective uh, out of Butterworth. Um, now, over time, that's gone from having a number of operational squadrons uh, under an Air Vice Marshal from Australia's uh, Operational Command into more conducting uh, an exercise-based set of scenarios over there. What my question is getting at now is, is the importance of FPDA as strong now, do you believe, as what it once was when it was stood up, based on we now primarily only conduct exercises rather than have an operational, hand foot, uh, um, an operational footing there? But also, um, is there potential, do you think, from Singapore's eyes that we could potentially grow that FPDA nature back into a operational headquarters again, which uh, has a collegiate approach to uh, operations in the Southeast Asian area of operations, and maybe a stronger role also for Singapore to play, noting that she is moving away from her traditional brown water navy into a more uh, blue water navy, uh, with also the ability with her uh, amphibious platforms to provide support throughout the region. Uh, on the latter point, I'm just not close enough to the RSN's thinking to really have a, a, a sense of that, but intuitively it makes sense that the Singaporeans um, would want to maximise FPDA, um, which is why I mentioned that uh, p potential sensitivity. Um, not that um, I think Indonesia is seen as the, the, you know, the, the, the unspoken threat. Certainly that's, that part of the dynamic has, has changed from when FPDA was... Uh, was, uh, was, was born sort of in the immediate aftermath of confrontation, and that clearly was part of the unspoken um, background. Um, I think the other part of the, of the, uh, the, the background that has uh, clearly shifted is the FPDA was um, its other main uh, de facto role was as a uh, way of keeping Malaysia and Singapore talking to each other. Uh, and that, I th the fact that that relationship now is probably at an all-time high and in fact, for that matter, I'd characterize Singapore-Indonesia relations at an all-time high. Uh, so it, it has morphed, uh, as all alliances and quasi-alliances have to that, that, are, that are around for that length of time. I think the, uh, the, the key to its survival is the, is the fact that it's flexible uh, and that it's not overly demanding of its participants either. It's a key caveat. It's an agreement to consult. It's not a, uh, an Article 5 type. Uh, binding defense arrangement. And that, I think, um, may also be the constraint on its, 
the development along the uh, the operational lines that you uh, that you've talked about. But I th I think it couldn't in the same way that like a lot of these arrangements, like the San Francisco system, you couldn't reinvent it now. But that doesn't make doesn't mean that it's not useful. And I think the fact that it's Southeast Asia's only multilateral defense grouping, uh, I think, gives it a sort of cachet value to its uh, Southeast Asian members. And of course, I mean, the question not for me to answer here, there are many in the room who could do it better. Um, but given that Australia, I think, is the one that brings more assets to FPDA than any other partner now, uh, really, the future of FPDA, in my view, is more in your hands than anyone else's. Touche. Um, one here, thank you, in the front of the room, in the middle. Sir, I am Lieutenant Commander Tayyip, Pakistan Navy from Australian Defence College. And as our respectable speaker highlighted, that India is uh, very engaged in the region for cooperating maritime security. Uh, my question is, uh, what are the impediments for India to joining existing cooperative maritime security arrangements, uh, which have been started by US under the UN Security Council resolutions like counter piracy or North Arabian Sea? And my second part is, uh, is there any tension points between India's look east policy and China's go west and harmonious sea policies? Thank you. I think, uh, good, good questions. I mean, I, I think the that India is the, one of the most active navies uh, in the Gulf of Aden, uh, and uh, that India is, is contributing to the uh, anti-piracy effort. Uh, the problem is that does it participate under the umbrella, uh, which, which Pakistan is part of it, and you have a whole NATO, EU, a whole range of uh, other uh, groups that are operating there. As I said, this is the tension, that, that do you work as a as a power, do you submit yourself to other groupings, the terms of which are being defined by the others? As I said, that is part of the tension. But I think in terms of the outcomes, there's no real difference because India is contributing, India is coordinating with the Chinese, with the Japanese, and the Koreans in terms of how to schedule uh, different, uh, the, the patrolling activity uh, in the Gulf of Aden. Second, I think, uh, I don't see, in fact, my whole book is about the, the overlapping footprints of the Indian Navy and the, and the Chinese Navy in the coming years, because China has, I believe, genuine interest in the Indian Ocean. Those interests are going to grow by each passing day. Uh, similarly, India is going to make its presence felt uh, in, the, in the Western Pacific uh, increasingly. So there is going to be some friction, I and mean, there's, no, there's no doubt about it. And I think the wisdom uh, in Beijing and Delhi, I think, is about uh, recognizing the emerging uh, frictions between the two of them, uh, and to find ways in which they can cooperate. My sense is, in fact, India and China have begun a maritime dialogue. Uh, they're going to explore potential ways in which they can cooperate with each other. Because from the Indian perspective, the Chinese Navy is going to be in the Indian Ocean. I mean, it's, it's a, not whether we like it or not, uh, it's going to be a reality. Similarly, uh, just as Indian Ocean is not India's ocean, uh, South China Sea is not China Sea, uh, there is going to be uh, India and other people present there. So, so I think the, the challenge is, uh, given uh, how do you minimize the friction that's going to, that's going to come, how do you expand the areas of cooperation between India and China? So I think we're beginning, uh, for the first time, really embarked on a maritime dialogue with China. And I'm quite hopeful that it will produce some results in the coming years. One of the more memorable lines of the conference, I think, uh, India's ocean is not India's ocean, the South China Sea is not China's sea. It'll be interesting to see if others have different views. Um, we'll take one more question before I begin to close proceedings. So if I can see a hand raised somewhere. Aha, right the far left at the top at last. Hello, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Bassing, Flight Force Development Army, and uh, about to take over the second battalion and be the commander of Australia's landing forces. Noting the comments from uh, the first session from Professor Maitken about a key element of deterrence and reassurance is communication, and that there's two parts of communication, one, what the speaker means to say, and one that the audience hears. What is India and Southeast Asia hearing with the development of Australia's enhanced amphibious capability? Do you want to take that first, Ewan? You're closer to home. <laughs> um, the question was about India specifically. No, India and Southeast Asia. India and Southeast Asia. Um, well, we, I think the... Um, 
it's a wider question, not just about the development of, uh, of amphibious capabilities, but also about the uh, attitude towards the marine presence in the Northern, in the Northern Territory and the growing uh, role of the United States around Indonesia, which initially sparked some concern whether that might feed uh, an, encirclement, an encirclement narrative in Jakarta. Uh, and if not in reality, then maybe at least it would give some ammunition to that as a populist line, which maybe in the course of a future election could come into play. Now, I, I don't think that's actually a, really a, a significant risk. Um, I think uh, for reasons actually have been covered in previous sessions, uh, the Indonesians are, are, are more likely to understand the limitations to that and maybe even to respond positively to the new um, opportunities that arise with uh, the Americans being um, uh, proximate. But I think that um, I would class it in that it, it, it's part of the, uh, you know, the, the wider dimension of uh, the, the strategic rebalance and Indonesian concerns in Australia's role within that and seeing uh, um, two amphibious, you know, uh, admittedly capable and large amphibious ships posing a, uh, a step change in Australia's uh, intentions towards the region. Maybe capabilities is a different issue. The South Pacific, I think, is, is um, uh, the region that wasn't mentioned, but I mean, that's where I see the more likely um, potential for their use. I don't think uh, India will have any problems with uh, Australian uh, amphibious capabilities. In fact, uh, India, I think, from my view, uh, that there should be more cooperation between India and, and Australia uh, to strengthen a more cooperation on the uh, both on the special forces and on the amphibious operations because we're sufficiently far away from each other not to threaten each other and we have sufficiently a shared interest in this part that we need to work together. And there was a point in the past as Australians were suspicious of the Indian Navy, uh, Indians had problems with uh, Australia's policies, but I think that's all way behind us today. I think one of the significant things that's happened in the region in the last 10 years, both the Labour Party uh, and the Liberal Party in Australia have invested uh, extraordinary amount of political capital in transforming the relationship with India. Uh, we have a joint declaration on, on maritime security. Uh, we have uh, stepping up our defense minister was in Australia uh, in June for the first time ever an Indian defense minister came here. So there is much that India and Australia can, can do together in the, in the coming years. In fact, uh, Rory and I are working on a thing that, that actually an India-Australia defense cooperation uh, can become a part of uh, what, what uh, Ivan talked about a middle power coalition and that you create enough regional capabilities that we share, we build, we help each other. That I think where India and Australia, uh, given our history, our shared uh, history, looking back at last 200 years, uh, there's much there that we need to rediscover and there's much that India and Australia are going to do uh, in the coming years together. I'm going to seize that moment to uh, just give a plug to a talk uh, that uh, Raj is giving tomorrow uh, at the Lowy Institute uh, on this very topic. So uh, if, you, uh, if, if you want to hear more, please uh, check the Lowy website or touch base with, uh, with me afterwards. We've got time just to, I guess, touch on one more issue, and I want to um, uh, abuse the privilege of being chair to ask this, this question, and I'll go to you, uh, Ewan, because you've... Um, you made an interesting distinction between maritime and, I guess, mainland Southeast Asia. If we can, if we can call it that, we'll, we'll leave leave the peninsulas aside. Um, where do you see Vietnam in this maritime mainland, mainland divide that you say is becoming, in some ways, sharper than ever? And I guess further to that, what do you see as the potential for others to partner with Vietnam on maritime security? Uh, I asked that question um, to some interlocutors in Hanoi um, in the last 10 days uh, and got the reply back, where does Vietnam see its identity? Because uh, clearly in a strictly geographical sense, it fits more into the uh, continental mold, having a land border. Uh, he replied that uh, historically, it, Vietnam sees its identity as a couched in Indochina uh, as, as maybe, you know, the sort of the French colonial construct and that, that still has a, a powerful um, continuing influence. Uh, and we see the accommodation, for example, that Vietnam has reached on the land border with China. I think uh, the nuances in the relationship between Vietnam uh, and China uh, as uh, embodying a sort of paradox of coexistence and conflict. Um, but the conflict, no coincidence, I think is mainly on the maritime area. And we see those two contending identities pulling Vietnam, I think, in different directions. Um, 
economically, there is a powerful logic for Vietnam also to become more maritime in nature. That's where the bulk of its uh, oil and gas uh, deposits uh, and therefore a lot of its future development will, will take it. Uh, and I think Vietnam um, also, uh, important distinction, actually thinks about these issues. It thinks strategically uh, in ways that um, aren't echoed in, in many other places in Southeast Asia. Uh, and I think it, it's a complicated strategy that um, Vietnam may be not totally coherent either, but there's a, certainly a, a strong sense that Vietnam is hailing on all channels at the moment and trying to internationalize to the, the, to the maximum possible extent. Um, but I think within that, there is a, a clear sense that uh, internationalization of the South China Sea is one uh, diplomatic objective, uh, and that the logic of that pulls Vietnam into a much more uh, maritime-based uh, network of strategic and economic relationships. Um, but it, it can't, you can't tow Vietnam away in the end. I mean, it will have to continue to have this um, double-edged relationship with China. Um, and I think that's why it, it's also critical to, to um, talk to um, Vietnam on China because it has also the, the alternative party channel that, uh, that others don't. Um, and uh, I think a sophisticated reading of, um, of, of, of the Chinese mindset that others lack. Um, Roger, we've got a minute to go, so I want you to have uh, the last word. And I know, I know that the India-Vietnam relationship has uh, been an interesting one and is uh, developing in uh, intriguing ways. So please, do you have something to add on Vietnam? Yeah. I think uh, many people see, I mean, India-Vietnam relationship as something recent, but I think uh, it goes back to the uh, the 80s, uh, where and India was one of the few countries that supported uh, uh, Vietnamese intervention to end the genocide in, in Cambodia. Uh, nobody gave us lectures on humanitarian intervention those days, but uh, uh, we, of course we paid a big price uh, for supporting Vietnam at that point. But I think this idea that uh, that India-Vietnam mm -hmm. have strong sense of being working together. Uh, that uh, endures, I mean, I think that goes back uh, to the 1970s you know, and the 80s. Uh, what we're seeing today is, uh, is uh, a significantly expanded cooperation because today uh, the circumstances have changed. Uh, India has more resources to offer. Uh, there is, uh, I think, uh, in the last few years, I, mean, I think there has been a significant expansion. As I said, a lot going on on the training side. Uh, there's a lot uh, likely possible on uh, uh, Indian financial support for Vietnam to acquire some vessels, you know, OPVs mm. and other ships from India. Uh, then there is uh, uh, Vietnam has been generous in uh, offering access to India to uh, to do more frequent visits to the uh, to its uh, uh, to its ports, uh, and that India is now more continually present uh, out there. Uh, so I think it's it's a, it's, it's just the Shall we say the beginning of a beautiful relationship? Look, we uh, we have to end it there. I, w I think we've had a, um, uh, I think a, an insightful and in some ways um, uh, provocative session because uh, we, we've looked at both the, the prospects and the limits for engagement. I think we're looking at some new partnerships forming in the region, uh, new ways of thinking about about the region, and um, mm -hmm. I think we've begun a conversation that. Uh, will certainly carry forward. There's a few lessons in this for Australia as it tries to allocate uh, finite resources to a whole range of important maritime engagement relationships. I want uh, uh, you to, um, to show your appreciation for our colleagues and we'll see you uh, later in the conference. Thank you.